I think our big group is in. You'll see that we have people mostly from Wisconsin, but also uh, from Amsterdam and Europe. So it's like multiple times, just like you're in a, a different time zone. Uh, so we're really happy that you uh, were able to join us and are very enthusiastic about your talk. So whenever you want to start, we'll be happy to start. Oh, the, other, the only other thing is uh, questions throughout are, are, are great. So if you want to um, either unmute yourself or raise your hand, I'll, I'll try to do some of that uh, keeping. Sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. And like I'm uh, like Jason mentioned, please feel free to interrupt me. This is sort of a long uh, time slot. So I'm uh, totally welcoming of discussion and uh, conversation throughout. Um, so by way of introduction, uh, I'm Alicia Martin. I got interested in this area um, in human genetics generally from a very young age. Uh, my brother was born with cystic fibrosis. So I was always very interested in genetics and was always paying the most attention to genetics. Um, so I was studying that in undergrad. I decided to go to grad school and was really interested in trying to think about what sorts of um, background would be most useful for thinking about sort of like biotech or some pharma or some area where I could have some impact on um, development of technologies that would be sort of directly useful to uh, biomedical um, applications and ended up really fascinated by population genetics and human evolutionary history. So it took like sort of a slight um, detour in what you might think of as sort of practical applications of genetics um, and really loved thinking about human evolution, learning about human origins, and also got very interested in disparities uh, early on in my PhD. And so I think, um, you know, having sort of uh, grounding in some social justice applications along with some direct applications to um, biomedical research were really where my interests lied. And then taking that from my PhD to my postdoc, I was then interested in kind of bringing back some of the population genetics lens onto looking at complex traits um, using large scale genetic data. So I started thinking back more into sort of like the hospital based setting. So that's kind of how I ended up uh, in this space. Um, and so with that as some background, today's uh, talk is titled Polygenic Risk Scores for the World, Current Applications, Limitations, and Promise. So I'm happy to sort of dive into areas that I'm thinking about in terms of polygenic scores and how we apply this uh, really broadly to a diverse swath of humanity. Okay, so without all as a preamble, um, I'm a geneticist. So as background, I like to start at the beginning. For population genetics, that means we need to look at this human evolutionary map and realize that humans originated in Africa on the order of hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, and then humans migrated out of Africa and took a subset of genetic variation with them as they populated the globe, which has consequences for how we think about genetic variation generally. So the average out of Africa population, for example, has about a million fewer genetic variants than the average uh, African population. So this human history over the course of the past 100,000 or so years um, thus informs the landscape of genetic variation across the world and is really important to consider when we're designing our genetic studies. So I think now is the most exciting possible time to be working in human genetics. Um, our studies have just grown explosively over the last decade. So around 2006 or so, when one of the first uh, major GWAS was published, we had on the order of hundreds to perhaps thousands of individuals in these uh, studies, but it's now routine that we have millions of individuals in our studies. So technology has just advanced so quickly and has enabled so many uh, useful and interesting uh, technologies to be developed that have enhanced our biomedical understanding of the basis of disease. I should mention, I'm uh, not a social scientist by training, though um, I work a butt uh, with it in my interest in ensuring that genetics uh, translates equitably. Um, so I'm very interested in talking with many of you about this uh, type of work as well and seeing how you're thinking about applying human genetics. Um, so over the course of the past decade or so, we've learned a ton about human history, but also about the biomedical basis of disease and of clear interest to uh, the social genomics, uh, social sciences folks. Um, clearly, we've learned a lot more about uh, not just disease, but also about the heritable basis of many different traits uh, of interest. So I see this all as serving the genetics mission, which is providing biological hypotheses from unbiased associations, fueling downstream functional analysis, and hopefully eventual therapeutic insight. But genetics has a huge diversity problem. So I'm showing the same uh, plot, but now colored by uh, populations that are going into these large-scale genome-wide association studies. 
Right now, about 80% of participants in these big GWAS are of European descent, which is far out of step with the global population where European ancestry populations make about 16% of the globe. So clearly we've got a huge uh, diversity issue. Um, looking at the bottom part of this slide, uh, one thing you can see is that as our studies have grown larger and larger, they have not necessarily grown more diverse. So for example, um, the peak uh, diversity of our genetic studies by fraction was around 2014. And since then our diversifying progress has perhaps stalled or even slid in the wrong direction. If our goal is to understand the genetic basis of disease, we fundamentally need genetic variation. So if we're narrowing our focus um, and looking at less genetic variation, we're bound to find fewer genetic associations um, and understand uh, them less fully in terms of their applications in uh, other diverse populations. So 2020, 2021 have uh, been really, I think, pivotal times for reflection of these issues. But I think it's notable that this has been a problem for a long time. Um, I just showed a slide recognizing that this has been an issue for over a decade since sort of in, uh, you know, over a century, basically since uh, we've been thinking about genetics. Um, but I think it's important to recognize how institutionalized and how ingrained the issues of uh, biases in science and biases uh, in society more generally are. So the you know major journals in our field, um, Science, Cell, and Nature, have all sort of uh, taken a look in the mirror and reflected on the fact that science has a racism problem um, and that there's really deep institutionalized issues. So. I'm going to divide the talk into three broad sections today and look at some lessons for genetic studies in diverse populations. Um, the first lesson will be that diversity is critical for the equitable translation of genetic studies. The second is how multi-ethnic studies are uniquely informative of genetic and environmental determinants of health. And then the last is where do we go from here and how do we facilitate diverse population genetic studies so that everyone can benefit from genetic technologies and that these do not instead exacerbate the issues that we're um, intending to uh, make better for everybody. Um, so to get started, uh, I think it's worth sort of getting everyone on the same page for what I mean by polygenic score. I'm assuming that you all um, are familiar with polygenic scores, um, particularly in the social genomic sphere, uh, but I just want to make sure that we're all um, sort of familiar with what um, sort of terminology I'll be using. So in the sort of, you know, healthcare space, when we run a genetic study, we get DNA from many individuals. We typically divide them up into patients with a particular disease versus non-patients and compare their DNA. Then we scan across their genomes. And if we see genetic variants that are more common in patients, this suggests it'll this particular genetic variant may increase risk of disease. Um, typically, the scenario that we're looking at is not one like cystic fibrosis, which is a Mendelian disease that I mentioned, where one genetic variant um, has a major effect um, on whether you'll have the disease or not, or is basically determinant of whether you'll have the disease or not. Instead, for most diseases that we're interested in studying, things like uh, diabetes and heart disease, um, schizophrenia, um, immune disorders, we're often looking at many different genetic variants that individually contribute a small amount of risk. So we need to aggregate these genetic risk variants uh, together to predict risk of disease. Oops. Um, so what we end up with is a polygenic risk score, which is just a risk prediction of an individual's phenotype from their uh, DNA. So we end up with these distributions that are fairly overlapping, um, but we end up with the healthy individuals and the uh, disease individuals um, where we predict basically that those individuals who are healthy will have slightly fewer genetic risk variants and those individuals um, who have the disease will have uh, slightly more uh, genetic risk uh, variants. So clearly for the bulk of this distribution from like the 1% tail to the 99% tail, these distributions are so largely overlapping that they're not the most meaningful to the um, general population. But you could imagine, for example, if you're in the 99th percentile or if you're in the first percentile, um, that you have quite a bit more confidence compared to the rest of the population about whether uh, you're likely to have this disease or not. So these might not be super useful to most individuals, but are more likely to be useful in populations as screening tools. Okay, so for a bit more detail on a polygenic score, 
I'm going to assume that we have a genome-wide association study that's been conducted before. Someone has done uh, one of these big scans and has looked in many cases in controls or in quantitative traits has run associations for this continuous variable um, with genetic variants across the genome and has put together something like this uh, big Manhattan plot on the right uh, part of the slide. So for all of the SNPs in the genome um, or all of the variants in the genome, we have a set of genetic effects estimated, um, and we have a target cohort that's independent of where we've done the study before, where we're interested in predicting someone's risk of having this disease. So we don't necessarily know whether they're a case or control, but we're interested in estimating their risk. So in this case, we take the genotypes from the target cohort, we multiply them by the effects in the discovery cohort in the GWAS cohort. Um, we multiply these together, we add them up across all of the SNPs uh, that we're finding are significantly associated or are associated at some uh, significance level. Um, and that's basically the polygenic score. There's of course some nuances into how you put these together, which SNPs are you choosing? Um, how are you estimating the effects? Um, and are you recalibrating these effects using some model that incorporates information about linkage to equilibrium, the correlation structure of the genome? Um, but that's kind of the essence of it. Basically it's, uh, you know, sum of products uh, across the genome. It's relatively simple at its sort of core concept. So polygenic scores have gotten a lot of attention lately in the popular press and in the media. Um, they've been talked about in several different contexts for biomedical purposes. Um, one is in a research context. So maybe, for example, you don't necessarily uh, want to predict whether or not someone has schizophrenia because that's a, a relatively straightforward diagnosis, um, but maybe you want to understand what their trajectory of their illness will be like. How likely are they to be readmitted? Um, how likely are they to respond to different drugs? So people have talked about polygenic scores as maybe facilitating deeper phenotypes um, in smaller cohorts where it's really hard to put together all of this phenotyping information, um, but where you can take more targeted questions that require more in-depth uh, phenot phenotyping information um, to investigate these types of questions. Um, the next area is in clinical trials. So people have talked also about uh, making clinical trials more efficient by identifying those individuals who are at higher um, heritable risk of a particular disorder. So for some traits, it's certainly the case that um, diseases are um, really likely to be influenced by genetics in combination with their environmental risk and perhaps having uh, some, some high genetic risk will um, inform some of the biological pathways that are impacted by a disease. And so that may accelerate the efficiency of the clinical trial. Um, the last area that people have talked about polygenic scores is in routine clinical use. So this is sort of the biggest kind of area that people are really excited about, sort of the precision medicine goals. Um, in differential diagnosis, I don't think this has a whole lot of promise because uh, usually when thinking about two different uh, diagnoses, they tend to be genetically correlated, which means the power of discrimination between those two different um, disorders is not uh, going to be served super well by something like a polygenic score because they are fundamentally biologically and genetically correlated. Um, but the area that I think has gotten the most attention is in preventative medicine. So this is an area where um, you might have a polygenic score that you can compute from birth. Um, understanding that risk information throughout um, an individual's lifetime may be useful for risk stratification and different types of screening. So for example, when thinking about um, breast cancer screening, we uh, adopt uh, mammograms, for example, um, and we can use those at different um, ages. We can use them uh, at different frequencies throughout life. So for example, someone at really high risk of uh, breast cancer may need to be screened earlier in life and more frequently than somebody who's at relatively low risk. Um, so that's an area that I think holds the greatest promise um, in that this might be a preventative um, purpose as opposed to sort of reactionary medicine as we, as we typically approach it. Okay, but now to the crux of the issue that I'm super interested in is how do ancestry study biases and genetics impact the generalizability of our knowledge? There's a few important considerations that I think are useful to uh, consider right up front, which is first that we expect the causal variant effects to mostly be shared across populations. And I think the way I intuit this um, is 
that basically the fundamental biological pathways are the same across different populations. The reason someone gets heart disease is because they have, uh, you know, plaques building up in their heart, not because of some issue going on in their brain, for example. Um, but what we think might be different about uh, genetics that makes it a little bit difficult across populations is this human history uh, factor. So allele frequencies, linkage disequilibrium, uh, these differ across populations. And then of course there are very complex factors that differ, including the environment, natural selection, other complicated factors that we also need to um, consider when looking across uh, diverse populations. So we've been thinking about this uh, for some time. We looked um, in a study in uh, 2017 at how genetic risk prediction um, varies across diverse populations. This, at the time, there was not, you know, massive scale data in primarily non-European ancestry populations. So we took on a simulation-based study as well as sort of an empirical study where uh, possible. So one of the first lessons that we took away from this is that genetic prediction accuracy decays with increasing genetic distance between the discovery cohort and the target population. To put that a little more simply, if you're studying European ancestry populations um, over and over again, the more genetically distant um, a population is from that discovery cohort, the worse your prediction accuracy is going to be. So thinking back to that human history and human origins uh, map that I showed at the beginning, uh, humans originated in Africa and then uh, migrated out of Africa into Europe, the Middle East, uh, Eurasia, and so on um, in the Americas. And so currently African populations are the most genetically diverged from European ancestry populations and are therefore going to um, have the least accurate genetic predictions simply based on our study, uh, study biases. The second major takeaway here was that polygenic scores can differ across populations um, in these big distributional differences, but these biases are not necessarily meaningful and these differences are kind of arbitrary. So for example, in the um, plot on the right here, I'm showing you polygenic scores for height. So we're using genetic data to predict individual's height in the Thousand Genomes Project. So publicly available at the individual level um, resource. And we're using GWAS summary statistics that came from the aptly named Giant Consortium, where they had conducted a GWAS of height in about a quarter of a million people. Um, and then we looked at how well that massive data set was able to predict height in the thousand genomes population. So what you can see in this plot is that we predicted European populations to be the tallest, followed by South Asian and admixed American populations like Hispanic and Latino populations. We predicted East Asian populations to be the shortest and African populations to be just taller than the East Asians. And these are not small differences um, across these groups. There are like five standard deviations of difference between, uh, for example, the European and African populations. So, you know, to put that in perspective, if the average European ancestry man is like five feet, nine inches tall and has a standard deviation of like two or three inches, if we we're explaining, you know, all of height with genetic data, then we would be predicting that the average African uh, man would be under five feet tall. So clearly this is very out of what we, out of, you know, expectation, does not match our observations. Um, and this is simply due to the, to the study biases that are going into this and the fact that there's some residual um, uncorrected population structure in a lot of these uh, GWAS summary statistics. So we need a lot of um, consideration to this population structure information when uh, looking at these uh, polygenic scores. Um, the last uh, thing that we learned is that neutral human evolution alone is sufficient to explain some of these differences. So you don't need to, for example, invoke any arguments about natural selection, um, that Europeans were selected to be taller, for example, to explain these patterns. Um, neutral human evolution along with some population stratification in these GWAS summary statistics seems to be a uh, more likely culprit for explaining these patterns. So a couple of years later, um, some of my colleagues recapitulated some of these findings with some finer scale uh, population data, again, using um, GWAS summary statistics from the giant consortium. So they put together data from the Thousand Genomes Project and the Human Genome Diversity Project to look at, you know, dozens of different populations around the world. And when they looked at uh, height, again, in these uh, globally diverse populations, they again predicted that European populations were predicted to be the tallest. Um, and that African and East Asian populations were predicted to be the shortest. 
But then something kind of interesting happened when they used this new major resource um, of the UK biobank data, and they saw that a lot of these differences seemed to disappear. So what's going on here? Um, as some background, the UK biobank data, I think, is already probably really relatively well um, known in this field of social genomics, of course, um, because it's such an amazing, useful resource. Um, part of what makes it so amazing and useful is that it was collected in such a harmonized way, um, all centrally um, you know, phenotyped and genotyped, which means that it was relatively straightforward to correct for population stratification, which was different from what was done in the giant consortium where cohorts were meta-analyzed um, and smaller cohorts were put together by many different investigators around the world. So that's a decent bit of what's explaining these major differences um, across populations. So this proposed, maybe that's part of what's going on. Um, maybe if we were just to harmonize super well all of our genetic studies, we would be able to get rid of these uh, differences in polygenic score patterns across the world. So to try to understand that a little bit better, um, I've uh, had some really lovely collaborations with some Finnish investigators. Uh, Sini Kermanen, in, uh, in particular at the Finnish Institute for Molecular Medicine, was really interested in testing this in the Finnish population. Um, partially because it's her home country, but also because Finland is a sort of an ideal test case. They have an excellent integrated healthcare system. About 10% of their country has been genotyped. There's a lot of social trust. Um, and one other um, really useful part to measure this is that um, Finland actually has a pretty sizable east to west observed difference in height. So in the south, uh, western part, or, yeah, southwestern part of the country where um, the capital Helsinki is and the uh, densest population is, um, people are about 1.6 centimeters taller than in the northeast part of the country, um, which is more sparsely populated. And so there's an observed difference um, across the country. So they set up, set out then to investigate how uh, different they're predicting actually these different parts of Finland using uh, data from different GWAS sources. So like before, they use the giant data, um, the UK biobank data, but they also had their own uh, Finnish GWAS data that was independent of their uh, target set. It was of course smaller, so there are about 25,000 people here. Um, with height measured uh, for which they conducted a GWAS. But notably one really appealing part of this was that it was run in a very similar way to the UK biobank data. It was all centrally processed, all harmonized in the same way. Um, so if the hypothesis that uh, conducting a GWAS all with central coordination um, is sufficient to co properly control population structure to the point where you're not seeing observed differences um, across the country, then we should be able to see that we're predicting sort of what the expected difference is and not over predicting these differences. So instead what we saw is that with the giant data, we vastly over predicted the height difference. So explaining about 14% of the variation, we predicted a three and a half centimeter difference. So we're not explaining the full heritable difference, but we're already over predicting uh, this difference. Using the UK biobank data and explaining about 22% of the heritable variation, uh, we predicted a 0.6 centimeter uh, difference between the Eastern and Western fins, um, which is about on track with what we expect. Um, using the Finnish GWAS data, um, where we explain about 15% of the phenotypic variation, we're already basically predicting the East-West observed difference. So if we're to extrapolate out and expect, uh, you know, if we're extrapolating out to say that we um, pr predict that we'll explain more than 15% of the phenotypic variation, then we'll end up over predicting again uh, this phenotypic difference. So this is not a sufficient explanation for um, you know, solving the issues of over predicting differences across populations uh, issue here. But perhaps even more problematically, are these really big disparities uh, globally? So polygenic scores, I think, are one of the most exciting possible biomarkers. I can't think of a single lab test that's so predictive across such a broad spectrum of diseases. You can have uh, just a blood draw and run your genotyping array, and you can predict your risk of diabetes and schizophrenia, um, cancers, immune disorders, uh, and also many different social traits um, based on the heritable um, component of these traits. Um, but I think the biggest challenge of implementation of genetics and precision medicine is the fact that our GWAS and our genetic studies are so Eurocentric 
that there are really, really big disparities in accuracy. So looking at this plot, for example, you can see that I've normalized our prediction accuracy for uh, 17 different quantitative traits uh, to one for European ancestry populations, and then I've assessed how accurately we're uh, predicting these traits um, in non-European ancestry populations. Um, and these differences are really big. So for example, we're predicting European ancestry traits about twice as accurately as in East Asian populations and about four to five times as accurately as in African ancestry populations. This is huge. I can't think of any like lab tests or uh, any drug that systematically across the board works so differently um, in different populations simply as a consequence of, of who we've studied previously. And we understand the genetic basis of this. So getting into this a little bit more, um, the first predictable basis of this is due to the fact that GWAS are best powered to discover common variants. So if we look at the GWAS catalog, which captures those uh, genetic associations with primarily diseases, and we look at the frequencies of these particular variants across different populations, we see that they're most common in European ancestry populations. So they have the greatest potential to actually explain phenotypic variation in European ancestry populations. This also means that there's potentially low hanging fruit um, that's polymorphic outside of European populations, but fixed in Europeans that remains to be discovered, which really highlights, I think, diversifying uh, efforts in genomics. We also see, for example, um, some evidence of this low hanging fruit in a uh, a project involving the UK Biobank, where instead of analyzing only the European ancestry populations, we're analyzing a more globally diverse uh, set of these populations. I'm looking here at, a, at two different GWAS of mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. Um, and you can see that most of the genetic association, uh, the p-values in these genetic associations are quite correlated falling along this diagonal. But there are some associations that are only coming up um, in the um, pan ancestry or more globally diverse analysis. And these are really massive effects that correspond to, for example, the sickle cell allele and beta thalassemia variants. So these are very well known, well characterized variants that you just don't find if you only study the European ancestry portion of the UK Biobank. The second really big um, issue here is that there are linkage disequilibrium differences across populations. So I'm showing just a region of the genome um, on the right part of this slide, where we're on the top right part of the triangle, we're showing what the LD is between pairs of SNPs in uh, East Asian populations looks like. And on the bottom left part of this plot, you can see what the um, LD correlation between pairs of SNPs looks like in the um, European populations. So along the diagonal, you see one, basically the SNP correlation uh, with itself. And further along the off diagonal, you see more distant SNPs. Um, and their correlation. So the LD structure sort of diminishes and you see this sort of like blocky structure course, uh, corresponding to LD blocks. For the most part, you see that the LD structure looks reasonably symmetric between European and East Asian populations, but you do see some outliers. So I'm highlighting in this arrow, for example, a region where there's more extensive LD in the East Asian populations that's not present in the European ancestry populations. Okay, so I mentioned um, that our causal variants are mostly shared across populations, but that our estimates differ. So how does this relate? Um, when we're looking at our causal effects, um, we, well, I guess I should back up and say, we don't really have a good way right now in GWAS to identify causal effects. We come up with estimated or marginal effects. Um, and these are sort of a product of the causal effects uh, by the LD correlation with other nearby surrounding um, SNPs. So this means that when there's differences in LD, we're going to have uh, differences in our estimated GWAS effects. Okay, and then the last uh, bit, I think we have a good grasp on the genetic reasons for um, differences across populations and these disparities in accuracy for these first two components, but we have a less clear grasp on the last part of this, which is they're clearly environmental, natural selection, and other complicated differences, including involving uh, how we're drawing our phenotypes. Um, across different populations that may also induce some of these disparities. Okay, I'm gonna pause there. Are there any questions before I dive into the second part of this? Alicia, on your last point, do you have, in your mind, if you were going to ballpark the contribution of problems from LD versus the, con the contribution of problems from environment, comma, selection, and other, 
uh, even focusing on, on environment for a moment, do you have, in your mind, do you think of it like 10 to one L, you know, 10 to one LD or something, or do you think 10 to one environment? It's a, that's a really great, difficult to answer question because part of it depends on which phenotypes you're looking at. And part of it also depends on which populations you're looking at. Um, there's really excellent work from Loic Yango's group that tried to quantify this a bit for, I think, height in particular, um, and BMI, if I'm remembering correctly, where they looked at um, the contribution of LD and minor allele frequency to drops in accuracy across populations. And it varied a lot depending on which population they were looking at. So I think the drop off, for example, in South Asian populations um, from European ancestry populations was something like, um, I'll get the numbers backwards probably, but it was either 25 to 30% or 70%. And it was reversed for the um, African populations. So the, you know, there it's gonna vary enormously depending on which trait you're looking at, which populations you're looking at. Um, and so I don't have a great answer for that, but there is some nice literature out there on that. A, a quick follow-up. I wonder if you'd even, I don't know if the right word is acknowledge that carving it up into LD versus environmental seems even fraught, like calling something LD, uh, you know, those populations probably have environmental differences that are not uh, um, netted out of the LD analysis. Is that fair? Um, so I'll get into some ways that we can look at this a little bit. One thing that I think is really useful and interesting as a way to try to tease this apart a bit is looking uh, within families versus within unrelated um, individuals mm -hmm. in a population. Um, people have looked at that a bit and have seen that traits that tend to have more um, sort of expected social um, contributions tend to have uh, more of these effects um, of disparities that seem to be coming from the environment. So for example, like education um, tends to be one that is a really big, uh, has a lot of structure within it that is probably more likely due to the environment than for example, these LD differences. So um, breaking it up into the LD versus environment um, question, I guess is, they're kind of running in different timelines in my mind. So LD happens over the course of, you know, thousands of generations, whereas the environment happens over the course of relatively quick turnaround time. So over the course of a few generations or so. Um, so I think using different tech, like different approaches, we can tease it apart a little bit, but um, maybe there's a piece that's fraught in there that I'm not really considering. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll bring this up a little bit later. Thanks. Sure, sounds good. Okay, so moving on to the next piece, we'll look at how multi-ethnic studies are uniquely informative of genetic and environmental determinants of health. So to get into this piece, um, we've compared two different biobanks that we were fortunate to have access to. Um, the first is the Biobank Japan, which involves about 150,000 or 200,000 uh, people from Japan from across the country. This uh, study involved a hospital-based recruitment that ascertained on having 47 different diseases of interest uh, to the biobank design. Um, notably, these came from different hospitals uh, around the country. Some of the health records were written records and then were sort of transposed into an electronic centralized form. Um, the UK Biobank, by contrast, is a population-based study uh, that was volunteer-based, which has its own set of biases, which, for example, mean that the population has been well-characterized now to, have, to be healthier, wealthier, and higher educated on average uh, than the UK population on the whole. Um, as I mentioned, this was a really harmonized study, so it didn't have some of the same um, challenges of bringing together data from different healthcare systems um, all into a centralized uh, resource. So I worked closely with Masa Kanai, who is a super talented grad student who's worked with the Biobank Japan uh, for a long time and is seemingly capable of running biobank scale analyses kind of in his sleep. He's very dedicated and uh, is a fantastic colleague. So our goal here was to compare polygenic score accuracy in the UK Biobank and in Biobank Japan. So to do this in what we thought of as the most systematic way we could um, was to first run equal size GWAS for 17 different traits and five different diseases in the UK Biobank uh, and in Biobank Japan. So this meant we were studying anywhere between 80,000 to 150,000 participants for each trait. 
Um, so then we computed within and across population polygenic score accuracy. So we held out some participants and then predicted within those as well as across uh, ancestry groups. So we were checking to see if we identified symmetric and comparable polygenic score accuracy, which um, would be what we would expect at the outset. There were certainly asymmetries in our polygenic score accuracy, and these were due to both ancestry, but also cohort differences. So I'm not gonna go through all of the results here, but I'm just gonna give you the key takeaways from this work. The first is that the ancestry matched results were always performing the best. Um, so when we use the UK Biobank data to predict UK bio, uh, predict traits in the other UK Biobank um, individual uh, participants, we were seeing that that performed better than when we use the Biobank Japan uh, GWAS statistics to then compute in the UK Biobank participants, which is kind of sensible. Um, but we're doing better when we use the largest meta-analysis. So if we, for example, meta-analyze the UK Biobank and Biobank Japan participants and then predicted either in a target cohort that was independent in UK Biobank or in Biobank Japan, we're always performing better with that approach. Um, the second takeaway is that heritability differs by cohort and by trait. So heritability is not a fixed entity. It changes depending on how you measure the phenotype, um, what your phenotype is, um, and on um, where you're measuring it. So we saw, for example, that the quantitative traits, the blood panel traits, um, things like height, um, things like BMI, were all a bit more heritable in the UK biobank, maybe consistent with this uh, population-based focus, whereas the disease traits um, tended to have higher heritability in the biobank Japan, perhaps also consistent with a stronger emphasis on the phenotyping aspect in these uh, hospital-based uh, patients. So because this impacts the heritability, it also impacts the, the phenotype precision also impacts the maximum polygenic score accuracy. So I'm showing, for example, that we're predicting these different traits, these 17 different traits um, in uh, UK Biobank Europeans using either the UK Biobank data or the Biobank Japan data. Um, and here we're doing uh, the best sort of systematically across the board using the UK Biobank summary statistics. Okay, so that's all I think really um, excellent groundwork for where do we go from here and how do we facilitate diverse population genetic studies. So my research goals are all to basically empower uh, diverse population genetic studies uh, through a variety of means to ensure that everyone can equitably uh, benefit from genetic technologies rather than having these exacerbate existing health disparities. So I see us having several different needs and many potential scientific opportunities uh, in genetic studies. So the first areas of needs are we need new statistical methods that better address the heterogeneity um, in our genetic studies. So most of these currently sort of assume some level of homogeneity um, in ancestry space uh, for participants. The second area is in data and community resources. So we need to ensure that these also apply equitably. When you do a GWAS, um, oftentimes it's the case that you just analyze the largest component of your um, data set, which has contributed to these Eurocentric study biases. Um, however, and like contributing to uh, the breadth of knowledge um, in underrepresented populations requires collating data across previous boundaries because oftentimes uh, these uh, participants that get left out of our studies um, are too small in an individual study, but only have sufficient sample size to make uh, good use of when collating across uh, different consortia. Then we need to support uh, these genetic studies with different resources. So we need to have imputation that's performing uh, accurately across different populations. When we wanna do functional studies, we need then downstream cell lines that have the genetic variation that's reflecting what's going on in our genetic studies. And then where we don't have uh, data um, representing a particular uh, population or ancestry group, we then of course need to grow to address these gaps. Um, all of this can't happen without ensuring that there's sufficient research capacity happening um, in home communities and in home countries to start to address these uh, questions, particularly with a diverse array of researchers. These um, needs being met will ensure that we have the scientific opportunities to identify novel associations. So for example, those associations at genetic variants that are uh, polymorphic outside of European ancestry populations, but not within. Um, there's also the potential to uh, more uh, accurately pinpoint these causal variants for functional follow-up. 
leveraging the diversity um, of our, hum our uh, human history will ensure that we're able to more accurately um, identify those genetic variants that are causing disease as opposed to are just sort of along for the ride and correlated uh, with disease nearby. Um, this will also ensure you know, this area that I'm most interested in is in genetic risk prediction. So in order to improve accuracy for everybody, um, we need to ensure that our, our studies are more diverse. You know, methods can get us part of the way there, but they're only as good as the data that we put in. So this is especially important for underrepresented populations. And then I think we have no ability to query those genetic and environmental determinants of health in diverse populations without um, studying these diverse populations in the first place and understanding which factors are actually shared versus uh, population specific. So this is a scientific issue. It's also, of course, like a huge ethical issue um, that I'm, you know, really excited to pursue. Okay, so dividing these up then for how do we facilitate these diverse studies, I'm going to go through sort of each of these on the need side and then provide some opportunities towards the end. Um, so the first area of methods is that we're working on is in developing the multi-ancestry meta-analysis method, which we're calling MAMA. I've talked about this for a few years now. This project took us longer than we anticipated, um, but it's been a wonderful collaboration with Patrick Turley, Raymond Walters, um, Hue, and Grant. And so for this project, we took GWAS summary statistics from two or more different populations, um, and we're interested in identifying those effect sizes uh, for each population. This is sort of similar to and extends the multi-trait analysis of GWAS method or MTAG, which Patrick developed previously or he led the development of previously. Um, and it also sort of is an extension that includes uh, LD score regression methodology. So we originally intended the development of this method to improve risk prediction for populations. Um, but after a lot of uh, intensive simulations and a lot of uh, hard work, what we learned is that this method works very well for um, producing unbiased estimates of GWAS that are better powered than other Bayesian me meta-analysis methods. Um, but being unbiased is not necessarily a great path for uh, producing uh, the best uh, predictor. So we learned in the end that this is a great method for meta-analysis, less of a great method for risk prediction. Um, so that's sort of a new area that we're still interested in exploring, particularly for recently admixed populations where the problems of uh, LD are especially um, confusing considering the recent mixtures of uh, ancestry from different um, continents that sort of make it challenging to come up with, uh, with a method that's sort of individually reliable. Okay, so the second big area that we're uh, moving in to try to address some of these needs is in uh, data and community resources. So I'll break these down into a few different areas. So the first is making better use of the data that we already have. So we've launched the Pan-UK Biobank study. Um, if you're looking for a large discovery data set, I'm sure that you've probably already been making use of the UK Biobank. Um, but one thing that was a little frustrating to us when we were looking at this about a year ago is that for several different ancestry groups, even the tiny fraction of uh, numbers that are included here, or even the tiny fraction included in the UK Biobank for underrepresented ancestry groups makes up fairly large numbers and sometimes the largest numbers of individuals that have been phenotyped for a given disease uh, in some of these populations. So we took on a massive effort uh, starting about a, a year or two ago, um, doing GWAS for all of the traits in uh, the UK biobank and for these six different continental ancestry groups. Um, so this was a huge effort and I really appreciate the help of everyone who's contributed here. So um, this effort was, as I mentioned, massive. So we've released as of last summer, about 12 terabytes worth of GWAS summary statistics. Um, we ran 16,000 GWAS of over 7,000 different phenotypes across these six different continental ancestry groups. We wrote about 17 pages of frequently asked questions with content targeted at both lay and scientifically inclined audiences that describes risks, benefits, and limitations of this resource. As you can imagine, uh, doing GWAS of different uh, ancestry groups allows for different um, analyses that can potentially be kind of fraught. Um, so we wanted to ensure that we were stating our uh, intentions and stating the limitations clearly uh, for this project. Um, in terms of methods, 
This, we used linear mixed models or generalized linear mixed models that were implemented um, in SAGE to run all of these GWAFs, which was sort of an improvement from simple linear regression plus principal components that had previously been undertaken for a UK biobank wide uh, GWAS analysis. We also looked at many new phenotypes. Um, these included fee codes. So these are, for example, aggregations of different ICD codes that uh, are getting at sort of broader definitions of a particular diagnosis. We also included prescription data. Um, we're continually analyzing and updating COVID-19 GWAS and contributing this to the COVID-19 host genetics initiative. Um, and there are many other phenotypes that are also new here. Um, we have many analyses that are well underway. So we're of course interested in identifying how many new genetic discoveries are we making compared to what we would have found uh, by only analyzing the European part of the um, UK biobank or European ancestry part. Um, we're also looking at meta-analysis. So we're also releasing, um, we've released summary statistics that are specific to each population as well as a meta-analysis across populations. Um, if people are interested, they can also do sort of a leave one out meta-analysis um, in case it's useful to test uh, different methods or test, for example, polygenic score accuracy for different phenotypes. Um, speaking of which, we're also looking at polygenic score accuracy and improvements by analyzing these underrepresented populations and ancestry groups. And then we're also looking at fine mapping for a subset, a small subset of the phenotypes represented here, since it's a computationally intensive uh, endeavor to undertake. Um, I pulled a screenshot from the um, FAQs. I know the um, SSGAC, Social Sciences Genomics Aggregation Consortium, has really pioneered a lot of frequently asked questions for large scale genomic studies that may be of interest. Uh, to uh, social scientists and more broadly uh, socially. So I just wanted to pull out kind of how we organized this. So in the middle, you can see sort of like what the questions uh, that we were sort of addressing were here. And on the left side um, with this little screenshot, you can see we um, sort of had a quick blurb that was intended more for lay audiences. It's sort of just like a quick answer um, for each of the questions um, that we sort of anticipated. And then the longer blurb gives a sort of response to a more scientifically inclined audience if they're more interested in the details, but not enough so to go digging through the supplement of our paper, for example. Um, this was also a fantastic effort working with Patrick Turley, Elizabeth Atkinson, and Shaniqua uh, Collier. Um, they're sort of wonderful, and I'm really excited to uh, sort of point you to them for on the social genomics front uh, as well. Um, Beyond the Pan UK Biobank project, we're also working uh, to collate data across existing boundaries through the Global Biobank Meta Analysis Initiative. This is a large initiative to bring together over 20 biobanks around the world to analyze uh, data at a scale that has previously been um, not possible. So there are now over 2 million genotype samples that have been that have contributed harmonized uh, GWAS summary statistics and have run their GWAS sort of all in a consistent way. Um, this is bringing together the power of massive biobanks to understand the genetics of especially understudied diseases. So as an example, um, asthma doesn't seem like an understudied disease, but in the genetics literature, it's actually been sort of heterogeneously and uh, studied previously and in usually relatively small numbers. Um, this is also an area where there's wide prevalence differences that have been reported across different biobanks. So you can see anything from about 2% reported in the China Kadori biobank all the way up to over 22%, for example, in uh, Mass General Brigham um, in, the, in a biobank in Boston. So we're using data from the Global Biobank Meta Analysis Initiative to develop polygenic scores, um, look into uh, different statistical methods that are being applied across populations and looking at how accurately we're able to predict uh, traits across different ancestry groups. Um, we're also making all of these uh, summary statistics publicly available, which is sort of different than has happened in some areas of cancer, for example, especially in some sort of um, areas of cancer that have been particularly under uh, under um, studied, I guess, in the genetics and GWAS literature. Um, speaking of large genomics resources, one thing that we find um, that's commonly an issue is that we're lacking large imputation resources for new areas of the world where we're um, interested in investigating new uh, and developing new cohorts and investigating new areas of research. 
So we're developing haplotype uh, reference panels that will facilitate um, data quality in underrepresented populations, especially in Africa. So for example, we're um, harmonizing and jointly processing data from uh, thousands of different uh, African genomes um, and bringing that together so that people can use that as a population genomics resource and also to improve data quality if they have uh, GWAS array data through imputation of their data. Um, and then we've also begun releasing a new public data set of an integrated human genome diversity project and thousand genomes project uh, data set. So this includes 30x whole genome sequencing data on the latest um, human genome build, GRCH38. Um, this is, I think, useful to mention because it includes a lot of populations that were previously underrepresented in public resources like just the Thousand Genomes Project by incorporating uh, the Middle East, Oceania, and parts of Africa that have previously been pretty underrepresented in uh, even such a big resource as a Thousand Genomes. There are about 220 million genetic variants in this resource, which is also more than double the size of previous iterations of the Thousand Genomes Project. Um, and we're in the process of developing, we're intending this to be sort of a default public data set for use in tutorials and reference panels. Um, this is a big team effort. There's um, some documentation on the bottom of the slide. If you go to the Nomad uh, website, there's a downloads link and you can uh, access this. We're in the process of sort of updating this so the link uh, may change, but um, that's available if, you, if you're interested. Um, so in terms of developing uh, areas of, um, new discovery and building new cohorts. Um, I've always been especially interested in addressing genomics gaps in Africa. Humans originated in Africa. They have the most genetic variation. Oftentimes there's quite a bit of phenotypic variation as well. So we've launched the NeuroGap uh, psychosis study, the Neuropsychiatric Genetics and African Population Study. Um, this study is on track to enroll 35,000 uh, African participants to learn about the genetic uh, basis of schizophrenia, bipolar, and uh, other psychosis disorders. So um, alongside this, we're building genomic resources for uh, African genomics, including an imputation panel. We're making uh, sequencing versus genotyping recommendations for new studies, and we also have a strong capacity building um, effort underway, which I'm excited to talk more about, um, but this is an in-depth training program uh, that runs alongside uh, these research programs and provides a lot of study resources to areas of the world that are sort of newer to conducting large-scale uh, genomic analysis. So the NeuroGAP study um, involves five sites across four countries. So there's um, a study site in Ethiopia and Uganda and South Africa. There are two study sites in Kenya, one in uh, Nairobi and Moy University and one uh, that's sort of coastal um, in, in Khalifi, Kenya. So one of our first um, studies in NeuroGAP was evaluating which data technology we should use. We know that a lot of the cheapest GWAS arrays that would enable a study of tens of thousands of individuals um, don't uh, generalize very well across different populations. So for example, the global screening array is uh, not so well named. It's actually a quite Eurocentric array. Um, and so we're interested in evaluating which data technology um, approach we should use for this full scope of the study. So we published last week a study that looked at uh, whole genome sequencing from over 90 individuals from the NeuroGAP study and did either downsampling or filtering to GWAS array sites to then look at how our um, data quality was performing. So we are showing basically what the raw data we got off the sequencer would look like if we did half X, one X, um, up to 20 X um, sequencing compared to a full depth 30 X genome. Um, we then did genotype refinement. So one thing that's different about doing um, low coverage sequencing versus high coverage sequencing um, or doing GWAS array analysis is that you have to rely on the genotype likelihoods rather than on the genotypes themselves. So you have to refine uh, the genotypes using some reference data set. Um, we did that here and saw that the quality of the data vastly improved when we conducted genotype refinement. Um, and then we filled in the gaps using uh, GWAS imputation. And so overall what we saw here, it's a little hard to see, but there's a bunch of um, sort of lines with X's that you can see that correspond to these different GWAS arrays. And then the um, low coverage sequencing uh, corresponded to the different solid dotted lines. 
Um, and so here we can see that running something like half X uh, or one X sequencing performs pretty similarly to what you see in the standard uh, lowest cost arrays like the GSA array or the psych chip array. Um, if you looked at arrays that are more optimized for uh, larger scale, um, larger numbers of SNP uh, genotyping, you can see that we're doing similarly to how you're doing with like 2x um, sequencing and that something like 4x is vastly outperforming um, these different GWAS arrays, including the H3 Africa array, which was specifically intended to target uh, genetic variation in Africa. So that's the approach that we're going to adopt for the full cohort is conducting 4x sequencing, since it's actually a pretty similar cost to some of these uh, medium to higher uh, density arrays. Um, so speaking of Neurogap and these different uh, technologies, we're very excited to have been recently funded to conduct the um, PUMA study, the Populations Underrepresented in Mental Illness Association studies. This is a big collaborative effort. So this is sort of an umbrella study that includes um, Neurogap, but also includes additional sites in Latin America, including in uh, Colombia, Brazil, um, parts of New York and Southern California. Um, as well as a new site in Nigeria and Western Africa. So this is a huge study, which is we're really, really excited about. Um, as part of this study, we're going to be addressing questions like which genetic variants contribute to um, schizophrenia versus bipolar disorder? Are they the same or are they different? Um, how are they the same or different across different populations? Um, are there causal variants that you're only seeing in particular populations, um, but are not uh, at high enough frequency in other populations? Are there distinct um, heterogeneous effects um, in which biology is actually per uh, perturbed by variants that increase risk? So this is an area that I'm super, super excited about, happy to talk more about. Um, I'm just gonna chug on uh, through given the, uh, given the time. Um, so the last area is in research capacity. So we're really passionate about um, training the next generation of diverse researchers in their home communities and in their home countries to be able to lead um, these endeavors. So we've uh, launched the second iteration now of the Global Initiative for Neuropsychiatric Genetics Education and Research, which is a mouthful, so we call it GINGER for short. This is a really immersive training program that runs alongside Neurogap and Pumas. Uh, so the first iteration of this was a three-year program that consisted of uh, workshops. So two week-long workshops that took place in Boston and in London. Um, more to the point though, we did uh, virtual weekly classrooms where they learned uh, how to use Unix, how to use R, um, bioinformatics skills, statistical skills, psychiatric genetic skills. This was sort of where they picked up their uh, bread and butter of doing psychiatric genetics analysis. Um, we also did on-site trainings. So there were 17 different ginger fellows who went through the really immersive program, but we wanted to make sure that these 17 fellows across these five different sites weren't the, weren't sort of like alone and left uh, unsupported in their local environment. So we launched also these on-site trainings that went to each of the um, sites involved in ginger and offered skill-based trainings that were tailored to um, each of the different institutions involved. So this was a really um, immersive program. The first iteration, as I mentioned, just wrapped up. The second round of this um, involves seven different uh, research fellows, uh, but for five years this time instead of for three years. So it's a smaller group, um, but we'll get more immersive training. And the goal at the end of this is for them to be able to write something like a K-43 grant uh, for the clinical fellows and to secure independent research funding and uh, sort of um, run their own research programs and their own institutions um, at the end of this. So I was super lucky to be able to work with uh, three of the research fellows in particular who I mentored on an immersive research project, uh, Nastasha Cohen, Lerato Majara, and Alan Kalungi. Um, and I all worked together on a project to assess the generalizability of polygenic scores across uh, diverse African populations. They had super impressive skill development over the course of the uh, several years that we were working together. So it was, you know, one of the most promising, um, rewarding experiences I've had as a researcher. So sort of recapitulating some of the earlier results, um, they showed with a broader spectrum of 30 uh, plus uh, quantitative traits, um, how polygenic score accuracy declines across different populations. Um, looking across a more targeted set of populations within the UK, Biobank African Ancestry participants, they partitioned up 
um, ancestry further to look subcontinentally. Um, Africa, different parts of Africa vary as much as different continents outside of Africa. Um, so you can see that reflected in genetic risk prediction accuracy here. You can see that prediction uh, of these different traits is most accurate in Ethiopian populations and least accurate in South African ancestry populations. Um, we also looked across cohorts. Uh, so using UK Biobank East African individuals, we compared to how we were uh, doing with a Ugandan cohort of uh, the general population cohort with about 5,000 Ugandans genotyped. And we saw that we were doing a little bit worse across cohorts, um, sort of to be expected. Um, a few things that popped up here when we um, analyzed and did a meta-analysis of uh, the UK Biobank alongside other cohorts like the Biobank Japan, um, as I talked about before, as well as also the PAGE Consortium, the population architecture using genetics and epidemiology, um, mostly African-American and Hispanic and Latino uh, cohort. We saw that prediction accuracy improved compared to the UK Biobank alone, sort of what you'd expect um, just based on uh, power. But one thing that's particularly promising is the areas where uh, accuracy improved the most reflect uh, the discovery um, cohort ancestry composition. So for example, you can see in the red um, that the admixed American uh, accuracy improved, um, sort of reflecting the page composition. Um, in green, you can see that the uh, East Asian um, accuracy improved, uh, reflecting the Biobank Japan composition and the Africans um, uh, ancestry improved uh, prediction improved as well, also reflecting sort of the page composition. There are a few sort of outlier traits here. So MCHC and uh, mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration and uh, WC is white blood cell count um, especially improved. Um, we were interested in sort of diving into understanding a little bit more why, keep the sort of surface level, but um, for MCHC, we know that studying diverse populations really helped us identify genetic variants that are known to contribute to sickle cell, uh, beta thalassemia, microcytic anemia, hemoglobinopathies, um, which are more commonly present um, in a population enriched in different um, non-European populations. Um, for white blood cell count, there are some known malaria resistance genes thought to be sort of a selective um, advantage that occur in the Duffy null allele, for example, in the Duffy blood group. Um, there's other sort of cancer related genetic variants that also seem to be more population enriched uh, outside of Europe that are also contributing to, um, you know, increasing prediction accuracy across these different populations. So for the sake of time, um, I, in the opportunities section, sort of went over more um, work that's being done outside of my group. I'm totally happy to go through some of these, perhaps in uh, some surface level detail in the discussion, um, but I'm sort of gonna skip through this pretty quickly so we have a little bit of time for questions and discussion. Um, so the first thing to, I think, just to mention is that polygenic scores are aggregating uh, genetic effects. They don't necessarily imply causality. Um, the second area is that um, polygenic scores can, you can integrate genetic and clinical measures when looking at polygenic scores. Um, you don't have to consider genetic effects on their own. And in fact, you really shouldn't. You should also be considering um, environmental effects, uh, other clinical factors, um, and other known phenotypes when predicting overall uh, disease risk. Um, we also have a good way of looking at rare and common variants. So overall, common variants explain more of the risk to populations, but sort of paradoxically, rare variants can have larger effects and be more important to individuals. Um, so we've been thinking about ways to combine these um, effects. For example, in the Finnish cohort, there are genetic uh, risk, for, risk variants for breast cancer that have a pretty big effect um, individually that we can model together with polygenic scores um, to more accurately predict cumulative disease risk. These seem to be kind of um, additive um, and you can see how that changes risk over the over a life course. Um, we've talked a little bit about the specific opportunities offered by um, families um, in particular. So I'm just showing a little um, you figure in the top right that shows that, you know, how much you smoke, your household income, years of schooling, um, the effects that you'll estimate will differ based on whether you're looking at sibling based studies or whether you're looking at unrelated studies. These types of um, studies are really important for quantifying indirect genetic effects, assortative mating, um, correlated to ancestry and environmental effects, um, and so on. Um, 
One thing that I think is really promising, I've already sort of mentioned, is that diversifying efforts are really disproportionately improving accuracy for underrepresented populations. So for example, when we looked at a GWAS of schizophrenia in East Asian populations, even though the cohort was a third the size of the Europeans, we we're already doing a better job at predicting um, East Asian schizophrenia risk with this much smaller uh, data set in East Asians. Um, so I'm just gonna say, skip to the next steps and say that polygenic scores are really promising. I see them as providing objective biomarkers and improving clinical models. Um, but also improving, uh, increasing health disparities, disparities, sorry, uh, due to these vast Eurocentric GWAS biases. Um, we need diverse GWAS, new methods, resources, and research capacity to address these. And it's always, of course, really important to communicate these culturally sensitive topics responsibly and widely. Um, these areas of research have been in the news a lot lately. Um, and I think it's really important to consider the implications um, of our uh, genetics work more broadly societally. I'll stop there and say thank you. Happy to take questions um, and discuss more fully. Thanks very much, Alicia. So let's do the raise hand if, we, if we're gonna get a queue going on the participant group um, for questions. Let's see if anyone has one off the top of their head. Let's see, Philip. Yeah, hi, Alicia. So this is super fascinating and uh, so cool what you're doing. It's, uh, yeah, I, I can't believe it. This, you're doing so much and it makes such a big difference. It's, it's really amazing. Um, so I was, I was just wondering, like from, a, from an economics point of view, it seems to me that, that one of the big problems uh, in terms of closing the gap um, is just the lack of genetic data that we have for non-European populations and in particular for, for African populations. And it seems to me that one of the big problems there is, is simply finance and money, right? So uh, I think one of, the, one of the big reasons why we have so much more data for European populations is because the data has been collected in rich countries that could afford this. Um, so, I mean, for you as someone who, who already has made steps in terms of closing the gap and collecting these data, what, what are your perspectives on that. So how do you think we, we can move forward? Is it, um, is it going to require like massive investments from non-African nations to collect data there? Or is there hope that they can catch up by themselves? Or um, how should we think about uh, yeah, solving that problem? Yeah, that's a super great question. I think um, there's, it's going to have to be sort of a multifaceted solution, like one um, big investment from one company is not going to like do it, one solution from one academic center is not going to do it. Things that I've seen um, that have been really beneficial from our work and especially have been sort of philanthropic investments and a shift in uh, federal funding priorities. So. Um, I will work at the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research. Um, they have gotten really behind reducing the um, idea that we need, sorry, they've gotten really behind the, our mission of reducing uh, global mental health disparities, um, particularly empowered through research. Um, so they've put a lot of money up for um, doing a lot of this global genomics work, um, which is why we've been so heavily focused on psychiatric disorders in developing parts of the world, um, because we've actually had the funds to be able to do it. Um, the NIH notably has also shifted funding priorities a lot more. And is, um, I think uh, you'll see that many of their RFAs are saying, um, you know, we're especially focused on underrepresented groups um, in genomics to be building new cohorts. Um, you're totally right that like all of the infrastructure that's been sort of built up is sort of given uh, wealthier nations sort of an advantage in doing genomic studies. There's a lot of like ingrained knowledge that's really um, useful that's come from a lot of longstanding collaborations. And I think those collaborations can sort of share some of the um, knowledge with uh, collaborators that are newer to this line of investigation um, to sort of bring, bring folks newer to genomics up to speed more rapidly than they had to learn it in the first place. Um, and then another, I think, major area that's worth considering is that the cost of sequencing, the cost of genetics, the cost of everything has dropped like incredibly precipitously. So I think we have a real opportunity to make up some of these gaps uh, with less than the funding that originally started um, and that we'll be able to make up the gaps faster by um, targeting some of these locations. It's incredible how rapidly these um, our collaborative investigators have gotten these um, 
uh, recruitment sites off the ground, there's less bureaucracy, there's less red tape. They've been able to just do an incredible job at recruiting um, and enrolling participants very, very quickly um, by having some of some fewer um, hurdles to actually jump through and less paperwork to fill out, frankly, um, which has been you know, really, really useful. You know, we've made sure that all of the proper guidelines have been followed uh, throughout this process and that no corners are being cut, but it's just incredible to see what the like human capital actually is um, and how much more you can accomplish with kind of less, um, less means on the ground um, in the first place in some of these developing countries. Great, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Nice to see you. Same to you. <laughs> thanks. Uh, see, Lauren's muted. Uh... Shoot, I keep forgetting to unmute. Um, yeah, I agree. That was wonderful, Alicia. Thanks so much for that talk and for bringing us up to speed too on all the amazing things that you're doing. Um, uh, and I have a lot of questions for you later, but um, we're going to meet. So um, I look forward to that. I had a question, kind of a more um, general question about ethics and about um, kind of what your view is on a lot of the criticisms that have been coming out. Um, you know, you, you showed the, um, the uh, kind of those New York Times articles that had come out that were based on David Rice's work and all the criticism that he's received about, you know, looking at, um, I guess, genetic differences across populations. And I guess I'm kind of, you know, do you think that there could, I mean, I think kind of our, our standard answer is always that um, you know, that there's most of the biological variation is occurring uh, within populations rather than across populations. And so if there are, you know, big genetic differences across populations, they're pretty small. Um, but do you think that, you know, especially for traits like educational attainment and so forth, that there could be genetic differences that are quite large across populations and um, that, you know, that or, or that maybe we just don't know? Um, and, and that, um, you know, for critics who say, why are you doing this work or, or, you know, this might just open a big Pandora's box to kind of be looking at all these genetic variants across populations. Um, yeah, what do you kind of, where do you fall in that, in that whole debate? Do you think that there could be, you know, causal variants that differ across populations and that those findings could have a big effect on how we, you know, conceptualize uh, ancestry and, and, and race and all these different things? Kind yeah. of like a, a big kind of ethical question, but yeah, basically on this whole kind of long-standing debate on biological differences across races, which you know we know race is a social construct, but in thinking about ancestry, yeah. So tough questions. Um, I think you know we're often in a situation where we're looking across groups, like in the U.S., for example, where. We do not live in an egalitarian society and our um, intention are, you know, if there is a research goal of looking across populations, it's sort of uh, potentially hopelessly confounded by uh, social like environmental differences across groups. Um, and looking back through like the whole, um, you know, history of our field, it's sort of rooted in eugenics. Um, a lot of the dawn of our um, biometrical models and our statistics that we use are sort of framed in an assumption that there are uh, fundamental differences across groups. My thinking is that just generally that's not super likely to be the case. That come like my thinking kind of comes from the fact that like we're looking at really polygenic traits where there are some, you know, the traits have some heritability, the traits have some environmental effects. Uh, when we look across different cohorts around the world, we're not really seeing that there are major causal differences across different groups. Um, you know, of all of the like studies that I've read, I've only come across a few examples where we're finding clear evidence of causal heterogeneous differences across groups. And those, you know, tend to pile up more in immune um, traits than elsewhere. When we've looked across, for example, schizophrenia, um, prevalence is pretty similar across different populations and the causal effects where they've been fine mapped tend to be the same in every group. So I think the differences are not going to be sort of proliferating from a genetics perspective. I think the differences across groups are going to be proliferating more likely from environmental effects, just from the research that I've read that looked at this very carefully and deeply. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that we just get a pass and then we get to say like, geneticists understand that <laughs> these differences are more likely to be environmental than genetic across uh, races, these and ethnicities and other social um, groups. Um, I think that means that we still need to do a lot of work recognizing the time and place that we live uh, to ensure that our science is being communicated in the way we intend it to be. I think some of the criticism of, uh, of folks like David Reich, who I think is, you know, a really um, brilliant researcher, come from the fact that there's sort of folks left behind when doing such types of research. So part of the reason I'm so passionate about developing research capacity in Africa alongside developing the research is that we're bringing investigators along with us and we're helping build research capacity on the ground along uh, with the whole research endeavor uh, developing. It's not always the case uh, and it's not always possible when you're looking at a field like ancient DNA, like who's whose descendants are you looking at? And are they gonna be particularly happy that you're looking at their uh, ancestors without approaching them? Um, it's, it's a, I think, stickier wicket to kind of look uh, in that field. And so I think it's just a harder problem. Um, we don't make it easy for ourselves by looking at genetic differences across different groups, but we also have a lot of, I think, tools at our disposal to try to bring everybody along and do this in a sort of equitable manner. Yeah, I think it's it's great that you're doing that. And I think it's also, it's important to do this work because it needs to be done and it needs to be done by, you know, really brilliant people like yourself. And I think, so I, I applaud the work you're doing. And um, I think that that was, yeah, it was kind of, it's this overarching longstanding question that I always have trouble answering. And so it was really nice to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thanks a bunch. And yeah, looking forward to chatting later. Yeah, absolutely. James. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I just want to echo what, what Lauren and, and Philip both said. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing this really important work. I, I did want to share a quick anecdote. When our um, social genomics group formed a few years ago, I do remember talking about your paper, your 2019 nature genetics paper in our group. It was one of the first ones we read and feeling like really motivated to address this problem of, of disparities, but also feeling really hopeless or helpless, I should say, because we couldn't do anything directly about it. So I'm actually really uh, enthusiastic about the progress that's been made that, that you've shared with us in terms of actually narrowing the gaps in terms of the, uh, the, the, the differences in terms of sample sizes across these different ancestral populations. We've still got a long way to go, obviously, but nobody would dispute that that's super important work. Um, I My question actually has to do with the uh, the whole goal of prediction accuracies in the first place. So I noticed that in a number of your papers, you've, you've sort of used the uh, European ancestry polygenic score prediction accuracies as the reference point. And I guess my thinking about that is that um, that reference point is always going to be different because as GWAS sample sizes increase, you're, you're, you're explaining more of the variance in that given trait over time. And so it seems to me like if you're always comparing the prediction accuracies of other ancestries to whites, well, the white polygenic score prediction is always going to be better because it's always increasing. And it seems like, you know, unless we can get uh, way more sample sizes in other ancestral groups, it's just never going to be uh, an equal comparison, right? So, so I guess one of the issues that I wanted to ask you about was um, maybe the goal shouldn't be to to find, you know, equal prediction accuracies across ancestries because, you know, statistically it may not ever happen. But the other thing is maybe we wouldn't expect that anyways. And this brings up, uh, I think, a bullet point that you brought up, which is that heritability estimates of certain traits differ uh, depending on the population that you're looking at. And so maybe it's the case that for something like cognitive ability, we would not expect to see the same level of heritability for cognitive ability in a population that might be, let's say lower SES and far more distressed than a Western population, um, at least based on some twin studies that have shown that heritability estimates of something like IQ tend to be higher in families of higher educational attainment than, than those with lower. So, so I guess part of the other issue that I wanted to bring up uh, or ask you about with regard to prediction accuracies of polygenic scores is that given the role of the environment, which I think you've, you've noted is clearly an important issue here, um, that seems to play a bigger role in terms of dictating how predictive these polygenic scores would be in the first place. And, and we 
don't really have great ways of sort of covering those effects out across different populations. So I'm wondering what your, your group has thought about that and, and what you think about that issue broadly. Yeah, those are all super insightful comments. Thanks so much for bringing them up. And also <laughs> to your comment earlier about reading the Najem paper and thankfully taking it, I think, in the stride that it was intended to, which is like, we're, we've got a lot of room to grow and it's going to take more than my group. It's going to take more than uh, the Broad. It's going to take more than the University of Wisconsin to, to close this gap. So uh, I appreciate the, you know, the comment. Thank you so much on that. Um, Towards the uh, the point of using sort of like where we're doing in European ancestry populations as being like the reference point. I totally agree. Um, that shouldn't necessarily be the goal. I think the goal is always a moving target because we can all, like with each advance in genetic technologies, we're like leaping bounds and uh, leaps ahead of where we were in, uh, earlier. So, you know, the reference point has always kind of been the European ancestry groups. And so I want to make sure that we're recognizing what we're leaving behind by having that be the bar um, and only improving um, in the European ancestry groups. Um, to another point that you made, um, so we are closing the gaps as we're going. I think one of the slides that I showed was like, if you start to bring together different uh, data sets that are from primarily uh, non-European ancestry groups, you're starting to see that the gap is closing by including some more of those uh, diverse ancestries, but it's not happening at the same pace as we're growing um, in our European ancestry uh, cohorts right now. So I think this diversion in investments um, and in, in continuing to raise these, um, raise these issues is important to ensure that like resource allocation is going where it will help the most. Um, I guess sort of notably one thing that I think is kind of interesting is that if we were to start this whole uh, genetic discovery activity like in a vacuum and start it all over again, just knowing about population genetics and population history, the first populations that we would probably be studying are African ancestry populations because uh, people took a subset of genetic variation with them as they migrated out. So we would actually learn more about the broad scale genetic variation um, than we do from um, studying European ancestry populations, but we'd have a lot of room to make up for um, other populations as well with that uh, strategy. So I don't have like a great answer for you, but I agree with a lot of your points. Um, I would also just mentioned that we framed it kind of in this way because I think folks hadn't really recognized that they had pointed out some of these flaws long ago, uh, but didn't recognize the issue at the time. So for example, the first uh, application in um, a GWAS where we saw polygenic scores is the International Schizophrenia Consortium in like 2009, where they had two cohorts side by side. Um, they had a European cohort and an African-American cohort, and they predicted uh, schizophrenia in the European cohort, like, I don't know, a Mat in order of magnitude uh, more accurately than in the African-American cohort. Um, and when I talked to some of the investigators sort of a decade later, they were like, yeah, we thought there was some sort of flaw in our statistical analysis. It wasn't a flaw. It was just like how they had sort of designed the study. So I think highlighting why we're seeing what we're highlighting or what we're seeing is also really important for uh, driving uh, where we go from here. So yeah, I'd love to talk with you more about some of these issues if you have suggestions about how to sort of frame some of these. Um, but yeah, it's a sort of complicated moving target, I would say. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for that response. I, I'm not scheduled to meet with you, but uh, I, maybe I'll touch base with you over email. It's really cool stuff you're doing. Thanks. Sounds good. Thanks so much. Sam. Hi. Yeah, th thanks so much for the talk. It was super interesting. Um, I was just hoping you could say a little bit more about um, that work that was with Patrick and Raymond on kind of, um, you know, extending MTAG to diverse populations and and you sort of alluded to the fact that, uh, you know, maybe it's, it's you know, finding the unbiased predictor here really isn't going to be the thing that, or the unbiased effect estimates are not, not going to be thing that sort of yields the, you know, most portable predictor or the best predictor in, in a sort of a different population. Like, is there some, you know, solution that involves like a kind of a Bayesian trade-off between, you know, you know, introducing, introducing some bias, but gaining some precision or how are you guys sort of thinking about the next steps there? Yeah, it's a great question. To refine that point just a little bit, um, I don't know that it's the, an unbiased predictor is less portable. In fact, I think it should be more portable, but less accurate. So this bias variance trade-off issue is kind of what we're up against um, with this method. So um, I, 
it might be the case that we come up with a more portable predictor uh, by using the MAMA method, but that performs worse um, in different populations uh, just across the board. So um, yeah, we'll have like probably, a, we have a fairly detailed section written up in the manuscript that we're hoping to post to BioArchive in the next couple of weeks. Uh, this project has taken a lot longer than we intended because we came up against so many things that were head scratchers. <laughs> uh, but for more details, stay tuned and I'm happy to send it your way um, if you're interested. Thank you. Yeah, this is actually a follow up on Sam's question. So there actually has been some methods out there um, um, with different focuses. I think that some methods focus more on fine mapping causal variants and some try to leverage sort of the transethnic genetic correlation across populations, use multi-ethnic semi-sets input to improve prediction for each uh, population. I, I wonder just in your experience, what method out there actually works the best um, in its current state? Because obviously it's very important to keep increasing the sample size for a diverse um, uh, you know, populations, but, but this sort of effort takes time. But based on yeah. the data we already have, what actually works the best? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So the like current um, methods that are being applied, so like I think pruning and thresholding and LDPRED were kind of like the original um, approaches that were used for polygenic prediction. Pruning and thresholding is the easiest, but performs the worst. Uh, of all of the methods that I think are out there. LDPRED does a little bit better, but is, or does substantially better, but is like quite computationally uh, taxing. There are new methods like uh, PRSCS and PRSCSX um, that do a you know, pretty good job and are more, much more computationally efficient, these continuous shrinkage prior based, uh, uh, Bayesian based methods. Um, those are currently kind of like my favorite because they're, um, relatively straightforward to get up and running. Once you're applying like a Bayesian method that, um, you know, models LD well in recalibration of effect size estimates, you're in a pretty good regime. Um, then it becomes an issue, not so much of like which method are you applying, but more of like what data are you using? If you look at all of the different methods that are out there being developed and applied right now, like the different Bayesian methods are all performing best in the author's hands who developed them. So there hasn't been like a core central activity to sort of really go through and benchmark in an unbiased way, I would say, <laughs> across different traits. Um, the across different traits and genetic architectures piece is also part of it. So like if you have, uh, you know, they have different priors, they have different SKUs. If you have a disease like Alzheimer's where there's a big effect of APOE and then sort of like a long continuous tail, um, that may perform differently with different methods than if you have something like schizophrenia where like the whole genome seems to be contributing and you have sort of more, you know, a closer approximation to like an infinitesimal model. So my recommendation right now would be to use one of the Bayesian methods that's uh, reasonably straightforward to run computationally. Um, there's so many methods that are coming out right now. Um, there's, you know, there's also things like s r which I think perform quite well. Um, the downside with running that one is you have to download like a 50 gig file to run it or something like that. Uh, there are things like polypred, um, which are more of this like fine mapping based um, approach. That one is also great, but is like a computational like beast to get running. So that's that's kind of where my uh, my train of thought is going at the moment for methods. Great, thanks. So we're closing in on time. Uh, I thank everyone for coming and remind people that we have an open date for especially for works in progress a week from now. Um, so let's uh, all thank uh, Alicia for this really stimulating talk and Q&A. Take care, everybody. Thanks very much.